The goal of this segment is to introduce you to ODEs, Ordinary Differential Equations, what they look like and how they relate to dynamical systems. A lot of the material that I'm going to cover in this segment and in the rest of this unit is covered in my notes on ODEs, which you can get to from uh, the supplementary materials page for this course under this unit in this segment. Now, ordinary differential equation may sound scary, but if you know what a derivative is, you'll have no trouble with this. An ODE expresses some relationships between some derivatives of an unknown function, like this. This is a very simple ODE. Here, the unknown function is x of t, and the derivative is taken with respect to time. That's the dt down there. You can take derivatives with respect to other variables, as you probably saw in your calculus classes. You also probably saw the shorthand notations that people use for derivatives, x dot and x prime. And often, by the way, people leave out the independent variable from all of this. I will do that a lot, since we are interested in dynamical systems, those that vary with time. And that means that my derivatives are almost always with respect to time. Now, to solve this ODE, you play Sherlock Holmes. We don't know x of t, but we know that its first derivative is equal to 1. And then we have to figure out what x of t could make that statement true. Here, the answer is pretty easy. x of t is all the functions of time that have a slope of 1. All of these are functions that have a slope of 1, so all of those lines satisfy that differential equation. In functional form, these are all written like this. So to find the exact solution of an ODE, you also need to know something to pin down which curve it is. What is x of t at t equals 0, for example? Here's a slightly harder example. Let's say that x double prime, that is the second derivative of the function x of t, is equal to minus the function x. And let's say we also know that at time equals 0, x is equal to, say, 1. This is an ODE. This is an initial condition. Now, Sherlock Holmes again. What function is the negative of its own second derivative? Well, for example, sine or cosine. Which one does the initial condition tell you it is? Cosine, because cosine of 0 is equal to 1, whereas sine of 0 is equal to 0. So we know that the solution to this differential equation is cosine of t. Now there are lots more codified ways to solve ordinary differential equations, which you learn in an ODE class. Our emphasis will not be on analytic solutions, like the ones we just wrote down. By the way, analytic solutions are closed form solutions. They, you can write them down with a finite amount of pencil symbols or chalk or whatever. The reason that we're not going to emphasize ODEs that have analytic solutions is because any ODE that can be solved analytically is by definition not chaotic, and I'll come back to that. But first, I want to talk a little bit about why ODEs. And the simple reason why is because they're good models. They're very good at capturing physics, chemistry, biology, economics, and so on and so forth. To show you how this works, I'm going to go through a quick example that, again, you may remember from your physics classes. It is a mass on a spring. Now the mass is m, and you all know that that means that there's a force down in the amount of mg pulling on the spring. This particular spring is a very simple spring. It pulls back on you or pushes on you in proportion to how far you deform it from its equilibrium position where it wants to hang. So let's say the end of the spring would be here if it weren't any mass hanging on it. But it's actually kind of here because the mass is pulling on it. This deformation is called x. And if the deformation is x, then the spring is going to pull that away in proportion to the deformation x. Now, if kx up and mg down are not in balance, the mass will accelerate, and the physics that describes that is f equals ma. So we can start writing our equation now. We can say, well, if mg down minus kx up is not equal to zero, then the mass is going to move. And the last piece that we need in order to figure out the differential equation for this is to look at a and realize that acceleration 
is equal to the first derivative of velocity, which is equal to the second derivative of position. And that means that we're done. We can write this with everything on the left-hand side of the equal sign if we want, like this. I can also divide through by m to get the x double prime term by itself, like this. Now, this equation actually looks an awful lot like one of the examples we just did a couple minutes ago. If k equals m equals 1 and g equals 0, then this equation looks like this. And we already know what the solutions to this equation are. They're sines and cosines. Which one it is depends on where the mass is at t equals 0. Let's say it's at x equal 1. Then the solution looks like this, a cosine. Now this is the position of the mass. What do you think the velocity looks like? Well, by definition, the velocity is the derivative of the position, and the derivative of a cosine is a sine. And this makes sense if you think about being on a swing. When you're all the way out at the end, your velocity is zero. And then, as you come back in on the swing, as you go through the very middle of the, of the swing, where it's hanging down at the bottom, that's when you're going fastest. One last point here. The way we've written things, the mass will oscillate forever. In the real world, that doesn't happen. Instead, the oscillation will die out because of friction. And it dies out faster if the friction is higher. So really, there should be another term in the differential equation to model this. It should look something like minus beta times velocity. So the overall equation should look more like this. As you heard in Jim Meese's segment on the standard map, the term dissipation is a generalization of the word friction. Dissipation plays a critical role in the existence of attractors. It's what eats up the energy as trajectories kind of relax down to fixed points, like the one in the pictures that I showed you for the spring mass system. You can still have chaos without dissipation. You just don't have chaotic attractors. We've seen one example of non-dissipative chaos already, the movie of the rotation of Hyperion, Saturn's moon. I'll talk about a bunch of other examples of Hamiltonian chaos in the very last unit of this course, but we won't dig into the mathematics very much. If you are interested in digging more deeply into the notion of Hamiltonian chaos, um, I would recommend Jim Meese's book for the mathematics and Ian Stewart's book, Does God Play Dice? for a less mathematical treatment. You can find links to both books on the supplementary materials page of this course.